in terms of Stardew Valley in real life or making money on our farm, uh, I view tourism and other things as uh, DLC. Uh, to summarize the last video, uh, it is uh, hard to scale and in the end you need to design a living biological system anyway so that people want to come and visit you. And so our goal is still, the main game, is to design profitable systems. And we've discussed over the last couple of videos, some of the commenters have started to discover why monoculture is so popular. Because it's complicated. And so we're going to dive in. I've taken some notes and we're going to dive in to some of these supply chains and value chains. And where are the exploits? How can we figure this out? It's quite complicated because every product is different. Uh, now, at the first level, when we think about farming, a lot of times we think about raw materials or direct use or, come on, focus, uh, or products that would go direct to market. I'll give you an example of this bamboo, and uh, this you could sell directly to market. People build houses with this. Uh, this is complicated, actually, because uh, you need special environmental licenses to exploit these bamboos. Uh, you can use them on your own farm without a license, but in order to sell them, uh, you need quite expensive and complicated legal licenses with the uh, DNR, basically, the Department of Natural Resources. And so they're trying, they're working to change that, uh, but selling raw bamboo is actually complicated by legal issues. Uh, but some of the transformations that are possible are not. And so, for example, we have the nursery, and so we create different uh, nursery uh, adjacent products like uh, little containers. These are the, actually the ones without bottoms because we get, uh, for every two with bottoms, we get an empty. And so these can be made little stakes. Or they could be decorated, they could become decorations. And so, but this has no environmental protection. So, in the case of uh, the Guadalangustifolia, the Colombian thorny bamboo, which is one of the really most useful bamboo species in the world, uh, the raw material is complicated, but the transformation is actually one of the easiest ways to get it into the market. Now, we have to talk with anything about markets, we got to talk about demand. And so this is a really interesting conversation about demand. And that is actually going to depend on logistics. Where can you get the product? There's some really interesting and complex analysis about limited demand pools. Uh, firewood, which is one of the products we produce, is used all over the world. There's demand everywhere. But where can I get my firewood to? Those are the only limited demand pools that I have access to. And so, and really, I would say worldwide, very limited supply chains in firewood. Firewood, uh, there is lumber supply chains, but not generally firewood. Firewood is a scrap product that occurs, and each region produces a certain amount of it. Lumber mills and areas where they have wood frame construction, like where I'm from in Wisconsin, Everybody's got access to scrap wood because they build a lot of things with wood and there's scraps and scrap wood becomes firewood. But in certain areas of the world, it might be more scarce. One interesting point with limited demand pools uh, is these are separate markets. You can create little monopolies or have oligopolies or uh, have any sort of a market setup depending on the specific limited demand pool you have access to. Remember, though, markets are flexible, so if there is something too good to be true, uh, other entrants could come into the market. For things like firewood, uh, I'm sure there is a lot of firewood not entering the market, and if the price were to skyrocket uh, because of some new demand in a limited pool where there's not a lot of supply, uh, other suppliers would probably come online. So all this is analysis we want to do on our raw materials, but also as we transform the things that we're creating. I want to talk about coffee plants, but I'll mention that pineapple is a great example of a raw material where there's generally demand everywhere, and so we're only limited to where we can get the pineapple. When you 
move raw materials further away, there's always a, a cost-benefit analysis, right? Uh, how, what is the cost to move it to that place where the price is how much, and does it make sense to move it there? And in what volumes, right? Because transportation has different units. And so you want to consider volume considerations based on limited demand pools you're trying to gain access to. Uh, pineapple is pretty much a raw material. Yes, technically we could either live near a canning factory or build a canning factory ourselves, but the volumes to transform pineapple into, let's say, canned sliced pineapples, uh, the really big volumes. You need really big volumes to make that jump, and so it's unlikely that we would put a canning factory up just because we grow a couple thousand pineapples. Coffee is the product that really opened my eyes to the value chain because it's a product that get, has to get transformed in many steps. So when we pick the red beans, uh, and, and a lot of times in the local region, they'll hire people to pick the red beans and they'll pay them per kilogram. It's a very sought after position in coffee harvest. A lot of people stop doing what they're doing in construction and other jobs and go to pick coffee on these big coffee farms because they pay per kilogram. You can make two, three, four, five times the minimum wage uh, if you're good at picking coffee. The red beans, not the green ones, and there's some other considerations. And so technically there's an intermediate step. The raw bean is sold between the worker and the owner uh, at a certain price. And so the owner is technically buying his own beans because hand picking is a lot of work. Next machine is a wet mill, which most smallholders will have a wet mill, and they'll mill them with water and leave them to ferment a certain number of hours, and then they'll set them out to dry. So they've shelled or milled the fruit off of the seed. The coffee that we consume is actually the seed of the plant, and mill them and then dry them in a drying rack. They call it here marquesina. But in fact, not everybody has a marquesina, and many smallholders will sell their coffee wet to a silo. I imagine there's not a ton of demand for this unprocessed coffee, except from people that want to continue to transform it. So the silos or the smallholders with drying racks will take their dry coffee to a number of different uh, buyers, right? And they will generally either have or represent roasters, right? And so they'll uh, buy a certain amount of coffee. The Federation, for example, buy, is the largest buyer of coffee in this region. And the Coffee Federation uh, manages certain brands of roasted coffee, Hillsboro, uh, Juan Valdez, in uh, foreign countries. Uh, but I could do that whole process. I could, uh, I have dried and I, we have roasted. Um, and we started to roast our own coffee, but uh, very soon, an independent roaster popped up in town and uh, started serving 30 or 40 different coffee farmers that wanted to get into roasting their own coffee. So a specialist emerged and, uh, you know, charged us to throughput into roasted coffee, a final product. Uh, one of the issues with that is that the final product then is here and not there. So with coffee, there's some quality concerns. Once it's roasted, it's fresh and it slowly kind of diminishes its qualities. So that's one of the reasons that I think the supply chain has led people in Colombia to mostly sell their dried pergamino or green beans and roast them. Uh, roasters in the United States uh, are the ones that are capturing a lot of that value add. It's not that we can't uh, roast. In fact, a lot of us are roasting but it's a, it's a logistical challenge, a supply chain challenge. With the coffee example, we can really see why monoculture is so appealing because it takes so much time and effort to learn a new market. Uh, one of the benefits we do have in the information age and something that where I've taken advantage of has, be, has been really great is that all the information is available. Somebody knows it. If you can get access either through the internet or through people that can point you in the right direction, you can basically learn uh, what's already been done, the best practices, who's buying and selling. This example here is lemongrass. So we can grow lemongrass, and we do. Uh, and there's several varieties. 
uh, one of the interests that I had was extracting essential oil. Uh, now, to justify the investment uh, to extract essential oil, we're going to need a lot of lemongrass, right? But in terms of propagation, the best way for me to grow a lot of lemongrass is to start growing small amounts of lemongrass and continue to expand and propagate my plants, right? It's, uh, I don't know where I could get 10,000 seeds, you know, uh, colinos. I don't know, I couldn't buy them. I have to kind of make them myself. So, you know, you start with 10 and then you get 40 and then you get 100 and then suddenly, like right now, we have about 300 and uh, if we put in some effort, we could probably turn these 300 into 1,000 or more and uh, we're working towards that. Uh, we're working towards figuring out where is the space for this uh, because we really are excited about essential oil extraction with steam distillery. That's something that we're learning about, investing time and learning about and, and one day soon investing some money. Um, but that day that we invest some money, we hope to have a lot of different plants ready. So in the meantime, what do we do with it? Well, there is a local market. You can go to the market and you can sell it. The issue for us has been the market, uh, the local market for people that make their uh, fizzy drinks and their, and their hot teas, uh, they want it with the root, all the way down the root. And the root is what we need to propagate. So we're, we're, we're looking to sell the stems and the leaves. And so one of the things we could do is we could transform it. We could chop it up, dry it out, or dry it out and chop it up and make uh, tea, tea bags, or we could sell it by the pound or the ounce, I guess, is kind of how you sell dried goods. So there's several different options that we have. We're working towards what we think, what we hope is going to be an exploit, which is uh, essential oil extraction uh, with a steam distillery, and that'll be able to be used not only on lemongrass, but for a lot of different plants. But in the meantime, we need to keep propagating them. We need to get, keep propagating them. We need to have thousands. They need to be fit into the system. We need to organize our rows, right? So it's, uh, it's something that we're aiming towards. This is just some examples from our own experience, but we, I'm fleshing out a framework um, and, and you guys are really helping me because we need to analyze the species. Obviously we need to have biodiverse systems. We get to design what our system produces. Now, some of that production needs to be biomass production, uh, and, and so part of that is not going to be harvestable. But the, what I'm proposing is that we look at a few, two, three, four, species on our property that can make us money. There's also time frames, like we talked about the lemongrass. Uh, we've sold some lemongrass, but probably we've made 50 cents and invested 1,000 hours, so it's not really a, a business right now. It's a medium to long term thing. We want to get essential oils. So maybe you can work in your, in your system. If you've got 10 species or 50 species or 100 species, you should be analyzing them over the first couple of years. Which of these things are hardy? What are their uses? What are their functions? And identifying in the short, medium, and long term, which of these species could be... 5% of, the, of, of a system, right? It, think about, if you're into permaculture, think about your zone 3. Think about zone 3 and zone 4. What are the species that could do well in systems like that with less intensive management? And as you select those, you'll get your medium and your long-term answers, or at least you'll start looking at possible answers to the question. What can we produce medium to long-term? Uh, so we're developing a zone 4 system with the Biburnum species and we think between uh, the Biburnum, between, with the Nacereno and with the uh, Madre Agua, those three species could probably make up about 60% uh, of, the, of the species there. Uh, we could have thousands of those and leave space obviously for the native species that want to add and show themselves and teach us what they're useful for as well, and there's a lot of them. I don't know all the uses. I'm still discovering species in these systems all the time uh, for secondary uh, forests systems. And so 
Um, we're going to leave space for them, right? We're going to let them come on up, and if they want to participate. Uh, but what we're going to do is continue to look closer to the house for some short-term uh, things, like pineapple. And so we should have multiple levels of short, medium, and long-term crops. Two, like I said, that's why I said two, three, four, in each of those categories. So if you want to look uh, to develop a system, you got 50 species. Not all of those 50 species need to make money. Uh, and they, realistically, I don't know what the limits are here. We need to test it out. But as a human putting together a system and learning all about these supply chains, I have a limited time of day how many YouTube videos I can watch. I can only learn about a certain species or product or type of product or limited demand pool uh, or transportation. I can only do so much of that each day, each week, each month as we analyze. Uh, almost, maybe not infinite, but r I can really learn a lot more on the ground. I can learn about 10, 50, 100, 1,000 species and continue to learn about them living but as it comes to transforming them and then defining, right, what are the tasks? So if with coffee, you got to pick the coffee. So that means I need to hire coffee pickers. Then I need to shell the coffee. So I can either shell the coffee or have a worker shell the co uh, coffee shelling worker. Knows how to work the machine. Can Got to dry the coffee. That has some tasks. You got to, uh, you know, air it out. You got to mix it up so it doesn't get, uh, you know, wet on one side, dry on the other. Uh, roasting the coffee is an art uh, mixed with some science. All of these things are trained. So, yeah, I can do it all. But there's time investment to become an expert on a specific point in the process. And uh, maybe not expert, but at least skilled enough to recognize if you're doing it right, if you're doing it wrong, what is the technique, the best way, the most efficient way, and enough so to teach the guy that you hope to pay money to do that task. Very hard to train someone to do something you don't know how to do. That's very difficult. And so what we've had to do is learn how to do many things and then invite people in. And a lot of times we can train them. They can come in and they can do that, become skilled, and then teach us. Actually, you know, I found that it's easier to do it this way. And so it's going to be tough to do that with 100 species, which is why I recommend, let's say, two short-term species, two medium-term species, two long-term species. Think of it like this. Uh, it, we'll take advantage, we'll keep it as low as possible, but we have to make it a mixed system. If you got your exploit right, if you have the one really profitable plant, maybe you only need one. Maybe you only need to sell turmeric, and the rest is, uh, right, tourism and happy days. You know, if you can dedicate a small part of your property to produce a large amount of income, well, you've hit an exploit. And uh, you take advantage of that and uh, figure out if you can do a little more of it or if you can do other things or how you can just support that with support species, nitrogen fixers, biodiversity. Um, it's a lot of variables, a lot of variables. And we haven't even talked about different ecosystems, which, you know, I have a very unique ecosystem here, which we're excited about, is is underrepresented. And so we're, we're able to make big progress because we're, you know, some of the first hundreds of people doing this type of stuff in this ecosystem, you know, and as opposed to in other ecosystems, temperate climates especially, there's been millions of people working on this and they have some pretty good models. Uh, so we'll continue, but we've got some variables here and we're continuing to work out a, a framework by which we can analyze how we can go ahead with profitable ecological restoration, profitable agroforestry, profitable biodiversity. See you next time.